loose cobordism. Um, and then from that information, you want to extract invariance of your structure, right? Invariance of, for example, syntactic manifolds, like we had for Gromov invariance, or in this situation, invariance of the flow, right? So let's remember where we were here. So let me, I mean, it was a long time ago, yesterday, but it's since <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm becoming tired. And so that feels like it's been uh, happening uh, a long time ago. So we had two Arnold conjectures. They were motivating us. Um, and uh, I guess everything, I was left sort of midway my lecture yesterday, so let me remind you a little bit what we had. So what do we have here? We had uh, a closed synthetic manifold, just uh, for simplicity, although I was hoping to talk about uh, the open case, this is what Lisa was mentioning, but let's keep it closed, okay? I'm not, I'm not ready to keep it open um, for, this, uh, for this lecture, for uh, final lecture. Uh, there, there is enough going on, <laughs> you know? Uh, let's sort of stay closed. So X is closed, and then we have the loop of Hamiltonian functions, just a loop of functions, so this is a loop uh, Hamiltonians, and from this loop of functions I showed you last time, you get a vector field, a time-dependent vector field, right? So it's a time-dependent vector field. Let me say it like that. Time-dependent vector field. It's really, uh, uh, you know, it's called a Hamiltonian vector field, and then you can look at its flow. You let your manifold flow by this vector field. In other words, you look at the integral curves, and you get a flow. And maybe the flow was called Pt. And what we were interested in, we were interested in periodic solutions to this flow. When do these uh, flow lines close? Right? And we, because the, this was time one, we are interested in when do they close after time one. We can then be interested in, in higher periods. But let me just uh, worry about time one periods. So we want, so we are interested in time one periodic solutions of this flow. Let, let's call them xt of the flow. Right? So this was a setup. Maybe a lot of uh, geometry or dynamics. So this is, this is an application if you want in dynamics in the dynamics of this Hamiltonian flow. All right, and our null conjecture. Well, one of the many versions of one of the many <laughs> sort of conjectures they go by, uh, by our null conjecture in this setup is the following. Uh, well, assume, assume we are in the situation above, but assume furthermore, assume that all periodic, well, time one, I guess, periodic solutions are non-degenerate. Okay. So we need we need this non-degeneracy condition for the statement to be like that. There are extensions uh, where you drop that, but it looks completely different. Okay. I mean, what the conclusion you are getting is a, a, a different story, and it's not, well, anyway, let's not go that, there. Uh, here it's, it's important, uh, in this statement, it's non-degenerate. And then the conclusion is then, the number of contractible periodic orbits of this flow, time one, one periodic orbits, is bounded below by the rank of the homology of the manifold. Okay? And as I was saying last time, Flor's idea of the proof of this was as follows. Uh, morally, the Morse theory for the action functional, I gave you the formula for it. I'm not going to redo it again. Uh, but I need to repeat what I've said at the end of the lectures because there was maybe too much stuff already to remember any of this. Uh, it, it's even hard for me to keep track of all the different things that go in, and I don't really expect you to, to remember from yesterday. But morally, we were supposed to do more theory for what's called the action functional, whatever, for the action functional. We call it AH, dependent on the Hamiltonian. And morally, doing more theory, uh, maybe some of you, um, 
are undergraduates and they haven't seen Morse theory. So briefly speaking, what you do for Morse theory, you start with a Morse function. Uh, well, okay, let me say it. Let's start with a function, which is <laughs> Okay, well, let's say. Uh, well, okay, maybe. John Torres. Yeah. It's a picture that Catherine had in her talk. Hmm? Catherine had that in her talk. Okay, Catherine had that in her talk, so Catherine <laughs> explained how to do more theory. But well, <laughs> what, uh, well, what, what you want, I mean, I, actually, I'm going to say a couple of words of what's a Morse function sh shortly. But the brief idea of what Morse theory is, is you start with the critical points of a function, you take a generic function to R whatever that means, <laughs> it will be Morse. You actually have to prove that. But the generic function to R from your manifold uh, would be Morse. And then uh, you look at its critical points. You make a complex out of its critical points. And uh, sorry, you, 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 yes. you make a complex where the generators are the critical points. And the boundary, or the coefficients of the boundary, count gradient flow lines. Okay? And, and the theorem in that situation is that this really is a complex. In other words, boundary square equals to zero. And furthermore, the homology you are getting is isomorphic to the usual homology of the manifold from this complex. Okay? So anyway, that was maybe too much to say. But, but, but the guiding light here, morally doing more theory, is that we really need to look at the critical points of A and H. That's if you want more theory, right? You should, you should start with critical points of age. And here on the third theory side, so this is Morse if you want, more early Morse. <laughs> and this is Fleur. Um, here on this side, the critical points of age correspond to periodic orbits, one periodic orbit. In fact, since I, was, I just was mentioning Morse, uh, so these are the critical points of H being non-degenerate, so non-degenerate critical point means something about the Hessian at a critical point being non-degenerate. Right? And that's in fact what it means for a function to be Morse, to have only non-degenerate critical points. Right? There's something about the Hessian. And I really correspond on this side to what I call non-degenerate periodic orbit. And that was this condition. This condition really is equivalent to saying this, this actual function is Morse. In other words, it has non-degenerate critical points. All right. And then we have, on this side, we also need to take care of gradient flow lines. That's what the differential is going to count. Gradient flow lines of A H. And that's going to correspond, in our case, to, to perturbed J holomorphic cylinders, right? So it's going to perturbed, perturbed I guess J holomorphic. It's not really J holomorphic, but let's say perturbed holomorphic cylinders. Holomorphic cylinders. So we wrote down the equation last time. I, I can rewrite it, but the picture was uh, so this this uh, critical points over here were were periodic orbits of the flow. Right? They close after time one. This perturbed holomorphic cylinders. We have and a gradient flow line between them. We have one on top, one on bottom. If it depends on your definition of bottom, maybe it goes down this way. Uh, uh, and then uh, what you had the image was some cylinder in between. It was a map from a straight cylinder U in, infinite cylinder. Um, maybe, well, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure if I should make my arrow. Well, there is an issue of orientations. Uh, I usually, when I draw this, I think of things going down. Uh, yeah, I should put them horizontally, but I got used with putting them vertically, and so everything is correct up to orientation. <laughs> up to sign which means you have nothing, but let's see. Um, <laughs> because if you do things up to sign, well, you can at most get something more too, but then you have things that possibly have fractional coefficients, and <laughs> then uh, you have nothing. But anyway, uh, up to sign, <laughs> up to orientations, uh, so this is S, maybe that's only like, maybe, usually, I mean, the reason, the reason why I'm drawing the arrow like that is because usually S goes up that way, but 
usually the gradient flow line start of going down. <laughs> so, okay, imagine that as s goes up this way, this goes down this way. So this is x minus, and this is x plus, and this is s goes to infinity. Okay, so, okay, then the other inverse minus. <laughs> this is plus infinity for some reason, and this is minus. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Ah, anyway, that's not, I mean, so that I'm, I'm getting that bugged down by some uh, sort of irrelevant little details, which are very relevant, but you have to calculate this and to set it up correctly, okay? But since I'm doing this at only a sort of philosophical level, this should be not so relevant. But anyway, but back to what these perturbed holomorphic cylinders are. They are holomorphic maps from this cylinder, S1 cross R, which satisfy the equation, their, um, their I mean, ds uh, u, uh, plus J T L U D T U. Uh, I never get the sign right. Is it minus? I think it should be minus, yes. It has to be minus. This equals to zero. This is the equation. This is the perturbed holomorphic math equation. And it's really the perturbed holomorphic math equation because if this Hamiltonian vector field was not there, then uh, it will be really the holomorphic math equation, but it's perturbed. Okay. So they are perturbed holomorphic and they are asymptotic. They are asymptotic. to x plus or minus as s goes to plus or minus infinity. Okay. So as it goes to either minus infinity or plus infinity, this the image of this map either is asymptotic to this uh, periodic orbit or to this periodic orbit. Okay. Just like gradient flow lines, I should have drawn them here. It's a bit hard. A non-degenerate critical point here would be a point, right? A critical point. And a gradient flow line would be something that goes between two critical points. A critical point, which we call x there, and we call it p so we don't get confused, but it's really x. So <laughs> there's a loop. A loop thought as a point in the loop space. But, okay. uh, and then here we go from, from one critical point uh, to another critical point. The Morse theory. Uh, this is the picture on the Morse theory side, and on, on the loop space side, you see this picture. All right. Too much, maybe, notation. But this is the setup. And then, as I said, um, want the translation between what would be sort of morally or formally Morse theory to what you want to do in Fleur theory. So back to Fleur's idea, what was Fleur's idea to prove our non conjecture? Let's put up the non conjecture. So it's visible. Sorry. <laughs> so Fleur's idea. was to do was to build up the floor theory. In other words, to make a complex out of these periodic orbits with a differential counting this, uh, the number of perturbed uh, holomorphic cylinders between them. So I'll make a complex. Coefficients of the differentials, they will count the number of holomorphic cylinders as they perturb. Well, the number of solutions to this equation. Okay, let me just say that. The number of solutions to this equation with these asymptotic conditions <coughs> count the number of solutions become a little bit more precise shortly. But anyway, that, that's, that's what means uh, consider do Morse theory. So that was the first thing. And uh, second one was if I'm going to call this Fleur theory, it's really Morse theory, more the Morse theory was absolute functional. But is this, if this Fleur theory is well defined, in other words, you can really make, make sense of this. You can really make a complex. You can really build a differential and then differential square equals to zero, right? You want a complex, <laughs> for example. Then, and so if floor theory is well defined and, so the other thing is, well maybe I should say, I should say if. Then you check by hand that floor theory in this case, uh, the way he did it, when, when the situation went floor theory, 
floor theory 25, in particular boundary square equals to zero, and independent of 